Good evening, everybody. Today is March the 5th, and this is a Moscow City Council meeting. And it is my pleasure to announce that we've got a Boy Scout troop with us here, troop number 345 with Scoutmaster uh, Todd or Tad Wheeler. Tad, would you bring all those fine young men up front so they can lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? And folks, when these scouts get up here, if you'd all rise with them, these young men are going to lead us in the pledge. So we'll wait till they all get up here. It is a good crop of good looking young men here. Okay, everybody, please rise. Lights back behind you. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Troop uh, 345. And of course, I always have a soft spot for scouts because I was a Boy Scout back in the day, 50 plus years ago. <laughs> so it's been a long, long time, but. Uh, their motto and creed I'll never forget. So it's always awesome to have you young uh, men here with us this evening. With that, I'll move on to the <clears throat> next thing of order, which is a proclamation for National Athletic Training Month. Uh, whereas the city of Moscow is a proud partner of the Uni uh, University of Idaho in an athletic training program, whereas athletic trainers have a long history of providing quality health care for athletes and those engaged in physical activity based on specific tasks, knowledge, and skills acquired through their nationally regulated educational processes, and whereas athletic trainers provide prevention of injuries, recognition, evaluation, and treatment, rehabilitation, health care administration, education and guidance, and compassionate care for all, and whereas the National Athletic Trainers Association represents and supports 44,000 members of the athletic training professionals employed in many settings, and whereas leading organizations concerned with athletic training and health care have joined together in a common desire to raise public awareness of the importance of athletic <coughs> training profession and to emphasize the importance of quality health care within the aforementioned settings, and whereas such an effort will improve health care for athletes and those engaged in physical activity and promote athletic trainers as health professionals. And now, therefore, I, Bill Lambert, the mayor of the city of Moscow, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2018 as National Athletic Training Month. And I have Matt uh, Smitley here with us this evening, and I'd like to present this proclamation to Matt, do you have others besides yourself, or just you? Uh, I'll be up here by myself. Today. Okay. Mayor Lambert and City Council members of Moscow. Uh, my name is Matthew Smitley, and I'm an athletic trainer and staff member uh, with the University of Idaho Athletic Training Program and with the University of Idaho College of Education, Health, and Human Sciences. Alongside, alongside me and with me are doctors Nisipani and May. We would like to thank you for your willingness to recognize and support athletic trainers through this proclamation. Locally and nationwide, athletic trainers are practicing compassionate care for all patients that they encounter. As highly educated, nationally certified healthcare providers, athletic trainers specialize in injury prevention, recognition, treatment, and rehabilitation. Athletic trainers provide care in countless venues outside of the traditional athletic, setting, athletic setting, um, including dance, industrial, and military settings. Whether you're walking Main Street at Disneyland, watching a Cirque du Soleil performance, or observing military exercises in Fort Benning, Georgia, you're, you are sure to find an athletic trainer nearby. 
Here in Moscow, there are about 25 athletic trainers providing health care to athletic, athletic and other populations in the collegiate, high school, and public settings. One of these avenues for health care lies in the Integrated Sports Medicine and Rehabilitative Therapy Clinic, or ISMART Clinic, at the University of Idaho. On a daily basis, our clinic staff provides health care to the U of I student population at no additional cost to them. We also provide care to the Moscow community, asking only for a referral from their physician. Within the College of Educa Education, Health, and Human Sciences, a profession-leading education program equips, prepares, and empowers athletic training students to create positive, meaningful change for their patients and future profession. Through this program, faculty, staff, and students consistently contribute to research and professional development that is advancing the athletic training profession into new levels of clinical competence and efficacy throughout the Pacific Northwest and the nation. If you have any questions about our profession, program, or clinic, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, we would also love for you to visit our clinic, um, hopefully not as a patient, but uh, if you would like to visit our clinic, we'd love to have you. Again, I'd like to thank you for being so willing to join us in celebrating and recognizing athletic trainers here in Moscow, the Palouse, and across the country. We are humbled by your efforts and look forward to continue serving the Moscow community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matt, and I appreciate um, Matt and uh, Lori. Dr. Lori. Dr. Larkins, yes. Yep. Uh, came in and see me one day, and I didn't realize that we had that, uh, what we had, one of the gems that we have on the Palouse here that we didn't even, that I didn't even know about here at the University of Idaho. So I will definitely be there to visit, and I hope it's not because I need you, but as we age, boy, there's a few kinks in us once in a while. It happens, it happens so Absolutely, it happens. It does come with the territory, but anyway, thank you very much. Any, any questions for Matt, from anybody on council? Thank you very much. Awesome. Man. Thank you very much. You okay. With that, I will move on to uh, item number one, which is the consent agenda. I move um, to accept the <coughs> consent agenda. Second. Okay. I got a motion by Catherine and a second by Gina to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion before I call roll? We'll start with Brandy. Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, we will move on to item number two, which is staff recognition report. Gary Reedner, what do you have for us this evening, sir? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm here tonight to introduce Tyler Palmer, our Deputy Director of Operations of the Public Works Department. We're here to honor tonight um, two members of our Water Department, Eric Peterson and Gary McKinney. So, Tyler, if you would join me. Appreciate oh, it, Gary. Tyler. Thank you. Hi, Mayor, Council. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I had an interesting experience when I turned 19 years old. I, I went to live in a foreign country, and uh, there was kind of a training program as part of going to live there, and, and a huge part of that training program was focused around water safety and how to safety, safely interact with the water system that we were going to encounter. Things like not brushing our teeth with the water that came out of the tap and not washing our vegetables with the water that came out of the tap, especially green leafy vegetables. Um, all the precautions that we had to take in order to not get sick from the water that was available in the public supply and, and how inconsistent the public supply was going to be and so how we had to store up water and make sure that we had water for purchase just so that we made sure that we could live. And uh, it was a weird moment for me having grown up where I grew up where I didn't know where my water came from and I didn't know where it went to because I never had to think about it. I, it was something I never had to consider. I turned on the tap and clean, fresh water came out and I didn't know how it got there. I didn't know how it got produced. I didn't know how it was delivered, but I knew that it was always there to the extent that I didn't know because I never had to think about it because it was just a given. It was, it was just a fact of where I lived. Um, as, as I got into public works and realized the effort that goes into making that happen and the professionalism that goes into making that happen. And I really had to think about those systems and think about what it takes to live in the society that we live in and the conveniences and the modern comforts that we enjoy. And uh, to me, it's, it's really amazing the people that commit their lives to this, that, that it's something that if we were to set out and just say, okay, we want to have a city. We all want to live close to each other because we enjoy interacting with one another. What's the first thing we need to have? It's clean water. And so if we're trying to pick the people who ought to be doing that, 
we want to pick our best and brightest to be doing that. I mean, it is the most fundamental part of being a human being. And for that reason, I'm really proud to serve with the people that we serve with. In our water department, we have some of the finest professionals in the whole country, and I'm just so proud of the people that we have. Um, we've gone through a little bit of a changeover like many departments have throughout the country. The kind of the silver tsunami is what they're calling it with the retirement of the boomers. And we've been so lucky to be able to recruit and train and have some wonderful staff. And we've been lucky to have the systems and the professional development funds available through the council and the budget to be able to train people and bring them up right. And these, these two operators that we're recognizing today are great examples of that. Um, Gary has been just a <coughs> wonderful employee. He's one of those guys that we're not big enough to have somebody just do one thing. We really have to help out a lot. He's, he's you know, on, on one occasion, we, Gary spent several, several hours in a trench fixing a water leak during the middle of the winter to make sure that people still had water and immediately left that water leak to go jump in a plow truck and help plow snow to make sure people could get where they needed to go. That's just the kind of guy he is. He's just committed and dedicated, highly intelligent, and has done a wonderful job for us. Um, and we've got Eric Peterson. Eric started in the water, water industry back in 2000, um, back east in Vermont, um, and has been... Uh, just a wonderful addition. Uh, he's really improved our valve exercising program. Um, he's uh, really worked on our construction standards, on improving our bulk water delivery. A lot of those little behind the scene things that people just don't see that are critical to make a utility work. So these are really just great examples of the kind of people that we are able to recruit and keep here in Moscow and that we're just honored to have with us. And so with us tonight, we've got Mike Parker, who is our water manager, who really keeps the whole thing running. He really does. Mike Dimmick, who is our production supervisor. We've got Justin Kilborn here with us who helps us run the distribution group. And then we've got uh, Eric and Gary who we're here to honor tonight. And we're just really happy to have them all here. So with that, we've got their certificates <coughs> that we can give to them. And uh, or we even want to do pictures, Gary? Oh yeah, so we let's get, uh, If we can get Eric and Gary to come up. One of the neat things, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, Tyler had mentioned it er earlier, these guys are all multitask guys. They can do things that's absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and you never think about it, and you know, we have safe potable water that we get to consume every single day, and nobody in this town even has to worry about it or think about it. And there's millions of people out there worldwide that do not have access to clean water, and that is a big thing for us. And it, you know, as a kid growing up, similar to you, Tyler, you just turned on the faucet, you put a cup under, you take a drink of water, nobody ever thought any different about it. And it wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I even thought about third world countries or even areas in the United States that have that problem. And these men and women that work for us take it very, very seriously to make certain that it is safe for all of us. And, and these are the folks that make it happen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very proud of every single one of them. So let's give them all a round of applause. Eric, Eric and Gary, they're just two guys that get out there and just get the job done. They don't have to talk about it. They just simply do it. And that's how these uh, folks operate. And I, and I couldn't be any more proud as the mayor of this town to, to be able to work with these guys. It's just awesome. So thank you very, very much, Gary and Eric. Okay.
We'll move on to the next thing, and that will be mayor's appointments. And I actually have six appointments this evening or for council's consideration. I have uh, Michael Kite, uh, Transportation Commission, expiration of 1231 of 2019. Michael Nelson, Planning and Zoning Commission, expiration of 1231 of 2018. Uh, Debbie Cadillac, Tree Commission, expiration uh, 1231 of 2020. Cindy Barnhart, Moscow Arts Commission, expiration of 1231 2020. Linda Pike, Fair and Affordable Housing Commission, expiration 1231 of 2020. And Amber Ziegler, a Sustainable Environment Commission, <coughs> expiration 1231 2020. I know I've got a few of the folks in the audience. Would you please stand up? I know Michael Kais here and Linda Pike. Is anybody else besides those two here? And I'd love for you guys to get a chance to come up and just say a few words, uh, Linda <coughs> and, and Mike, about yourselves. How's that? Because as a mayor, I certainly appreciate those volunteers throughout our wonderful city that make up for these various commissions. So please come on up and tell us a little bit about yourself. Even though most of us know both of you, why? Let's get I, your picture out there. Well, I, I've lived in uh, Moscow a little over 30 years, and um, my recent uh, job I was a, a hearing officer and a board member of the Idaho Board of Tax Appeals and one of my jobs was to conduct hearings on uh, property and homeowners frequently appe appealed their property valuations and uh, I guess that that and just knowing how much my home means to me made me want to uh, help others and see what we could do to have affordable housing in Moscow because I did hear many stories of people who one time was a, a miner, the mining company had built his house, he was able to get it for $10,000 when he retired, but uh, it was currently worth $200,000 and you know, how do you stay in your home when the value goes up like that? So that and volunteering for Habitat for Humanity, and uh, that also piqued my interest. So I really do appreciate the appointment and hoping I can be of service. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, very much. Come on up, Michael. We haven't voted on either one of you yet, but I'm pretty confident. Come on up, Michael. <laughs> 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 better watch what I say. <laughs> so uh, as a member of that silver tsunami, I'm happy to be here and really am honored by this appointment. I had my first job in transportation, I hate to admit this, almost 50 years ago with the city of LA traffic department. And while I think I've gained a lot of expertise over the year, I think years, I think the most important thing I have to offer is um, I'm a good listener. I think I can synthesize information and I think I'll tell the truth. And I think in a lot of the controversial issues that the council has dealt with in transportation in the last few months, the bridge being one of them, um, I uh, hope, hope <coughs> I'll bring the same sense of honesty to the commission that I have as a, just a regular citizen uh, on other issues that come up. So thank, thanks again for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Thank you very much, Michael. With that, I'd put this in front of the council to entertain a motion to approve all these folks. Mr. Mayor, I would move approval of all the candidates on the slate. I'll second that. Okay, a motion by Jim and a second by Brandy to approve all six of these commission appointments. I'll start to roll with Ann. Aye. 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 And here again, thank you very much, uh, Linda and Michael. I appreciate, um, we've got lots of great people in this city that volunteer for commissions, and sometimes it's not an easy thing to do. They take up time. I've been on several commissions myself before I was ever an elected official, both on planning and zoning as well as board of adjustment. And we appreciate the fact of folks being honest and being able to say what they want to say. and and bring it right forward to us. That's how we all learn. So anyway, thank you both very, very much for being here. Okay, with that, I will move on to the next thing, which is a public comment and mayor's response period. We allow 15 minutes uh, of time for folks to get a chance to get up and uh, tell us who they are, what their name is, their address, and, and let us know what's on their mind, as long as it's something that is not on this evening's agenda and or something that is on planning and zoning or uh, Board of Adjustments. So please come on up and we'll give you three minutes and let us know what's on your mind. It's funny. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council, I uh, appreciate the time to be able to say a few words to you tonight. Uh, my name is Marshall Comstock. I'm uh, at 932 Mountain View here in Moscow. So 
As, as many of you know, I started my political roots here in Moscow as a young man. Uh, approximately 40 years ago, Mayor D. Hager appointed me to the Board of Adjustment. And now, almost 40 years later, again, I am on the Board of Adjustment thanks to Mayor Lambert. It's amazing how life takes its roundabout and twists and turns. You never know how it's going to be. I was also part of the first council that actually occupied this room. I was part of the, before I was, I was elected before the renovation and then we used to meet over at the police station during the renovation and so I was part of the first council that is sitting where you guys are sitting now. So um, I was thinking back today of some really fine moments with my tenure here at, at the council and I'd like to share a couple of those fine moments with you. Um, the first one that I can think of is the 1912 building. I was among <coughs> the first council that decided that we wanted to go ahead and buy the 1912 building from the Moscow School District. And I was, I'm happy to say that I was the swing vote on the council that actually made it happen. And I think it's very fitting tonight that, that Jenny's here with us and she can tell you a lot more about the jewel that we have with, with the 1912 building. Uh, the next thing I was fondly remembering was the night that I sat in Bob Hamilton's living room and drank bourbon with him. <laughs> and as, as you know that because of Bob Hamilton, we now have, have our Hamilton Low Aquatic Center and we have our, our Herc building. And it was actually part of the grassroots that started the ice rink that we have now and hopefully that it will help the, the, current, the new ice rink that, that will be coming. Another fine moment that I can remember was the afternoon that a, the mayor and three council members decided that we wanted to appoint Gary Reedner the, as city supervisor. I think nowadays you'd probably call that an illegal meeting, <laughs> but I can say that it was one of the best things that this city ever did was hiring Gary Reedner as city supervisor. <clears throat> Another thing that I think back on that was a little bit comical was the night that we passed our topless ordinance. <laughs> the whole front and, and second row were filled with, with ladies that were prepared to flash us as soon as the <laughs> ordinance was passed because it wasn't legal until the ordinance was published. So we got a good flashing that night. And I think <laughs> back how funny that was. And the final thing that I'd like to um, kind of reminisce about was the, the city signs. Every time I drive into the city, I'm very proud to see that those city of Moscow signs are where they are. So thank you. So because this city means so much to me and this council chamber means so much to me that I'm very proud tonight to announce that I am a candidate for the, the fifth district Senate seat for the state of Idaho. And I feel very good about announcing it here in these <coughs> council chambers that mean so much with me and being with so many friends and my family. I'm really proud to announce that tonight. You know, I'm, I'm not very fond of labels, but if I had to label myself politically, it would be as a moderate Republican. And oftentimes around election time, you hear a lot of political rhetoric. But there's two things that I can promise you. One, that I will always support local, local government, cities and counties. And two, that when somebody wants to have a meeting with me, I will make that happen. I will meet with any individual or any group whenever I can on any subject. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Marshall. Hi. Thanks for giving me some time tonight. My name is Peggy Gottschalk, and I'm running for county treasurer. Um, I've lived here all my life, born at Gritman and raised near Potlatch on a farm. And I graduated from Potlatch schools, and I attended the University of Idaho and earned a bachelor's degree in business and accounting. And numbers have been my a calling for a long time and and I do well at at, at that I uh, after I graduated from the university I worked for several local businesses uh, being a full charge accountant in high school I uh, had my first 
connection with being a treasurer, I was the student body financial secretary. And since then, I've uh, volunteered at my church. I've been the treasurer there for over 20 years. I volunteered at uh, Paulette Youth Baseball Organization. I was a treasurer for them and, and on the board. And I've been involved with the local Republican group. I've been a chairman of my precinct for about 10 years, and I was a treasurer for the Leta Republicans as well. I decided to run for uh, county treasurer because I have the skills and the background and the qualifications to do so, and I, I have a vested interest in this county, and I haven't called anywhere else home, so this is where I'm going to stay. I've been married to my husband for over 33 years, and we have two sons. And uh, if you choose me to be your county treasurer, I will be transparent, trustworthy, honest, and uh, of full disclosure. And I, I believe I'm the best candidate out there and have the best qualifications. So please vote for Peggy Gottschalk, <laughs> county treasurer, May 15th. Thank you, Peggy. <clears throat> Anybody else before I move on to the next thing? I have, even though I was up here, I had something else I wanted to, okay. to say. Um, my name is Linda Pike, and I reside <coughs> at 1026 East 3rd, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I wanted to especially thank Catherine Bonzo because she called me this week, and, and I had written a letter to all the council members, and I really appreciated Catherine calling me and we had a, a discussion about the third street bridge and so i really i i just wanted to express my appreciation for for her interest and in our conversation um i i did appreciate being appointed to the fair and affordable housing commission and i it has disturbed me that i've heard this week that somebody from the city has contacted the property owners by the creek about needing more width for the bridge and I don't know all the details but I understand that a meeting might take place this week and it was my understanding originally that no private property would need to be acquired for the bridge and I hope that's still the case and since a motor bridge is apparently very important to the council and since over a half a million dollars was found for its construction I hope that all the council persons and the mayor will imagine how they would react if it was their home next to the creek. I hope that each of you, if you haven't already done so, will <coughs> visit the site on both sides of the creek and that you will picture yourself living in one of the homes there. It's my understanding that most, if not all, of these property owners bought without any knowledge that a motor bridge would be constructed there and funnel traffic from across Mountain View right by their front doors. I know at least some of these owners are retired and this is their retirement home. I fear what it will do to the values of their homes. I fear that they will not be able to sell. I ask you if the prospect of at least 100 cars per day crossing this creek is worth ruining not only the heart of Moscow but the homes of these adjacent property owners. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Your Honor, if I may. Yeah, Gary. Just to respond to that, it's my understanding that the engineering department has contacted the four property owners at the corners of where the bridge would lie, not to obtain property to put an oversized bridge in, but to obtain construction easements to ease in the construction of the bridge. So it was not more property for the bridge itself. Well, thank you, Gary. Sometimes, you know, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you have rumors and different things that float around. And that's, you know, that happens in any community. It happens in our community as well as other communities. And, and we move forward. We're going to do the right thing by folks. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to come on up. David, you want to speak? Come on up, sir. David Pierce, 716 East F Street. This is a thing that I wish I did not have to do, but I do. Over the past few months, we have had several letters to the editor, a special city council meeting, a workshop, 
And finally, last Thursday, an editorial in the Moscow Pullman Daily News, and tonight we had yet another comment, all about the same thing, all about the proposed multimodal Third Street Bridge. This is not the first time that a bridge has been proposed to connect Third Street to Mountain View. The issue was discussed in <coughs> considerable depth shortly after I got here over a decade ago. I remember searching with Walter Steed for alternatives. The issue then, as now, was how to provide another connection between downtown and Mountain View. The only current possible way to do this is Third Street. If Moscow is to grow to the east, there has to be more than the current two through streets, 6th Street and D Street. I see no other alternative than 3rd Street. Having said that, I am very disturbed at the way the city has dealt with this situation. To the best of my knowledge, the first anyone heard of this latest proposal was at the time of the budget hearings in July of 2017. It was soon made clear to the public at large that the bridge would be built. There was no discussion with the Moscow citizenry as to the merits or problems of the bridge at that location. There would be no presentation of why the proposed bridge was necessary to the continued growth of the city. There would be no dissemination of the results and implications of traffic studies which were done several years ago. The decision had been made. End of story. At least that is the way it appears to me. This is a different way of doing things for Moscow. I have learned in my time here that the citizens of Moscow expect a civil presentation and discussion of any significant proposal. The manner in which this proposal has been presented has prevented this from happening. Yes, there has been and will be citizen input to the precise nature of what will be done to ameliorate problems on 3rd Street as a result of installing a multimodal bridge. But there has been no discussion of why this bridge must be multimodal. I feel certain that this multimodal bridge will be built as planned. I am sorry it has been presented to the citizens of Moscow in the way it has been. It undermines my trust and faith in city government. Thank you, David. I'll make a comment about the Third Street Bridge. It's, it has been absolutely no surprise, in my view. It's been something that's been discussed for years. And we had a number of different meetings, and I don't remember. I sent a letter out, Gary. You can. Refer. It seems to me like we had at least 17 encounters. Right in this very room, for almost a two-year period, we had frequent folks come in and talk about a pedestrian bridge and bike bridge and in that process came up the other developments talking about the multimodal plan that was adopted in 2014 it was gone through in 2012 13 and came to this council in the city in 2014 and so the point being is there was nothing sly about this this was right out in the open it was discussed out in the open. I've discussed it with hundreds of people, personally myself. I've been right down there exactly where that bridge has gone in on both sides of that creek, and it makes absolute total sense to me. Now, I know that's not popular with some folks, and uh, but i got to share with you, there was nothing underhanded, nothing that was slipped by. This was part of the process, and yes, it was in last year's budget, it was in last year's budget workshop. <coughs> and by the way, uh, Garrett from the Daily News did, in fact, report about it during that budget workshop. And evidently, I, I don't know, there was some that had saw it and some that had not saw it. So there's nothing that has been underhanded whatsoever. Now, you can have your own personal feelings on it, but it has been a point of discussion for a couple of years that personally I know of, ladies and gentlemen. And so... Look at you know <coughs> folks that um, struggle with it. I get it. You know uh, I lived down there for 13 years. Personally, I would have loved a bridge. It would have made life easy for me. I get no benefit out of having a bridge here personally myself. I would have when I lived down there for 13 years. It would have been great. It would have been an easy way for me to go to my employment, as well as others. And so. With that being said, I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is item number five, Citizens Commission Report for an Affordable Housing. we got Ryan Cash here and Randy. 
So if you'd like to come up and do your presentation. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, City Council, members of the public, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to sit here and have you give us a, a moment of your time to go over this very important commission. All of Moscow's commissions have a very unique role and a very purposeful role. Many times these commissions do work that's, that's behind the scenes, not necessarily in the limelight of day-to-day -day politics or day-to-day -day operations, but still it's vital to our community. And I'm proud to say as the staff liaison for the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission, that this particular commission has done great things and is looking out for the best invested interest of those within the most vulnerable capacity in our community. Boy Scouts, thank you for coming. Again, this is a, an excellent uh, opportunity to learn about government. Uh, I thank you again for, for your roles uh, as citizens within our community and your, your service and dedication to your organization. I thank you. Your guys' volunteer work will continue to progress and it will have a great impact within those youths and, and within you as young men as you progress as well. I'm actually an Eagle Scout from Troop 345. Um, with that though, uh, going back to the commission, again, I wanted to say that the, just like the Boy Scouts, we have volunteers that are passionate about what they do on this commission. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the previous commissioners within this organization. And I also wanted to thank those that are now serving. Looking at the, the, just the list of qualifications, the unique background that each commissioner has within this commission is simply amazing. I, I, I don't say that lightly. The, just, just the vast backgrounds, of the experience, the education, the different perspectives that each member takes and brings to this table is, is absolutely fascinating. And it takes a unique person to organize that and to keep things rolling and keep things in general direction. Uh, there's great things that are happening within the commission and I'd like to introduce the Chair, Randy, you want to come up here and give an introduction of what the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission has done? Well, yes, indeed I would. Ryan, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Hello, Randy. Mayor, Hi. Council Members, how are you this evening? Thank you for your time tonight. And Linda, thank you for your interest in the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission. And if I can get this right, no, there we are. We're just going to start out with a little introduction about um, who all is on our commission. Uh, myself, the chair. Casey Holcomb is our uh, new vice chair. We had uh, just had a, an election of officers here this last month, and, and Casey is the new vice chair. And Melanie Wolf is our new secretary. And by the way, Melanie is a brand new member of the commission. She was just uh, uh, appointed here a month ago, and she immediately stepped forward and wished to uh, participate a little deeper. Uh, Jill Maxwell, who has been on the commission for uh, many, many years. She's kind of the matriarch of the whole project. And you'll see that Casey Holcomb is listed on here twice. She wears many hats in this community. She's involved in a lot of different kinds of things, and she's very important to us. So we put her name on there twice. <laughs> uh, Jamal likes it. Bruce Pickman, Rachel Lane, Kirsten Miller is also a new uh, commissioner. She's just been with us for a month. And Linda, thank you very much. Your name will go on here as well. And that little circle there with one vacancy now should go away. Uh, then Ann Zabala, uh, the council liaison, Ann had been a commissioner. We really valued her participation when she was elected to city council. We're really delighted that she was assigned to this commission to continue on our work. And then, of course, Ryan, you know Ryan very well. He, he's very valuable and instrumental to everything that we're able to put together and, and keeps us in line. Um, so just a real short review. Um, in 2016, we had uh, submitted to the council our final analysis of impediments to fair housing. This is a project that we have to do every 10 years, and it um, is part of the, the state requirement to make us eligible for uh, state funds that are distributed through HUD. Um, there were some basic conclusions that we arrived at. Um, first, that there is a perception of discrimination of housing in Moscow. Now, the people that had responded to the survey, none of them acknowledged that they had been discriminated against, but they do believe that there is discrimination going on 
in Moscow. So there's a perception there that we um, are trying to tackle and trying to overcome. Uh, second, there is a clear perception of income discrimination within the respondents, indicating that income is their most significant factor in their choice of housing. A lot of these individuals would prefer to move to live someplace else to be in a nicer location, but they can't afford it. They can't afford to live closer to, to their school or, or to the playgrounds or to their shopping. So. Um, money is really the, the cost of it, the cost of um, housing. And then lastly, uh, we did determine that the annual income to rent expense ratio for renters uh, reaches what is called housing cost burden levels, and that's 30% of your annual income. Um, Moscow, and it depends on which survey you really look at, we're either the third or the fourth highest cost of housing in the state of Idaho. And it's clearly reflect, reflected throughout all of the surveys that we do take. Um, so out of those three um, conclusions, we had c talked about some actions. Um, we are going to uh, develop programs and partnerships that specifically address affordability. And I think that you're all familiar with the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust program. They came out of the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission several years ago. Nils Peterson is the executive director of that. And, and he's been making some progress and uh, cutting some inroads and, and bringing some of the awareness and some of the issues forward. Uh, I think he's doing some very valuable work. Um, we're going to present an affordable housing proclamation, and you'll be hearing more about that next month, so I'm not going to dwell on that very much here today. April is uh, a fair and affordable housing month nationwide, so we'll be back talking a little further about that particular topic. Um, and then where can training programs be presented? What the, the training programs that we have, um, let's see, yes. Um, embraced are largely uh, centered around rights and responsibilities. We're reaching out to um, particularly young people who are coming out of uh, college housing or they're moving away from home and they're looking to enter into the, the rental markets for the first time. They're, they're signing leases, but they don't really know what's going on. So we're really trying to do an educational program, uh, making, uh, helping them become aware of their rights and responsibilities. Uh, we also work with landlords and property manager, managers to talk about rights and responsibilities from their side of it too. So both parties to these contracts have both rights and responsibilities. Um, and then a new project that we're presently working on, and, and the technology of this is a little beyond me, so Ann Zabala and, and um, one of the uh, senators from ASUI are really kind of the instigators of this, but we're creating a webinar. Um, or a series of webinars to address these rights and responsibility topics. So I really do appreciate Anne's participation in that, and, and we're, I'm looking forward to getting this uh, actually produced and posted out there someplace on the web, <laughs> wherever that's at. <laughs> Um, okay, so some of the projects and accomplishments, and this slide loaded up kind of backwards there just a little bit, so I'm going to draw it all up. Um, last year, we had uh, three sessions. Um, uh, on March 1st and March 3rd, we had done a, a couple of workshops up on campus with uh, student housing and uh, 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 trying to address these rights and responsibility topics to students who are coming out of student housing. Um, this was co-sponsored by ASUI. As long as we have their co-sponsorship, there's no cost to rent a room or anything on campus. So we're really appreciative of their, their interest and participation. Um, so the whole focus was on landlord and tenant guidelines and right, rights and responsibilities. Um, they, um, oh yeah, um, this was, uh, the, the project from Intermountain Fair Housing Commission, the, the Idaho uh, uh, Fair and Affordable Housing Commission. We, we sponsor them to come up here to Moscow every year. 
and address uh, the tenant or the, the landlords and property managers and, and realtors and lenders. We get um, a, a real good turnout, mostly from property man managers and um, the uh, landlords. And they put on some really good programs. This last year, they had really addressed discrimination and anti-harassment issues. Um, they had worked with uh, some uh, conversation about national origin, and I might have to ask Ryan to help me with this, but limited English proficiency. proficiency. That was it, yes. So some language barriers, uh, how to communicate with your, your tenants. Um, and then there was a lot of question and answer about that. They moved on into familial status uh, topics, uh, occupancy and rules regarding children. Uh, and then reasonable accommodations and modifications and service animals. Some great topics and, and wonderful questions and uh, huge uh, participation from the crowds. Um, there's just a picture of the, uh, the group that was gathered at the 1912 Center. Uh, there were um, 30 that attended that particular session that day. There were another five that went down to Lewiston to attend the same program down there because they couldn't make it on this same day. So <coughs> we do this every year. We get anywhere from 30 to 50 participants in it, and I think that it is very well attended. Uh, a lot of great interest, and the, the landlords and the property managers really want to do the right thing. Uh, but the laws are so complex that uh, helping steer them through the rights and responsibilities takes some uh, very well-educated people. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to uh, continue doing here, uh, we're going to uh, promote the Fair Housing Month in April. We're going to continue <coughs> uh, providing training and informational materials. Uh, we've got a lot of this stuff posted on the website uh, through the, the City of Moscow's website. Um, and we've got uh, examples of leases so we can provide people who are looking to move out into the community and sign leases. We can give them examples of it and explain it to them. Um, and um, the basic principles as to why um, affordable housing is important here in Moscow, and that's going to be a, another uh, portion of what we're talking about with this proclamation that we're going to present to you next month. Um, we do work um, through the, the Moscow uh, Farmers Market. We have a, a booth there with the city of Moscow and trying to get some information out. Uh, we stay in contact with the Sojourners Alliance, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and of course the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, very important um, uh, alliances that we have with them. Um, we're all very well um, uh, have been introduced to the inclusionary zoning takings training um, that uh, the state of Idaho has um, taken a position on. Uh, sometimes I wonder why that is such a big topic, but uh, really makes uh, um, uh, developments um, limited from our perspective. So they, they do not have to um, uh, set aside any portions of the development for uh, less expensive housing. So our ongoing projects um, uh, will continue with the landlord-tenant workshops. The month of April is going to be Fair and Affordable Housing Month. The Fair Housing Training is going to be the third week of May. We don't have the exact day on that yet, the 15th or 16th or 17th. Uh, you would all would be invited to that. Um, and then, of course, keeping all of our resources current and available, as well as getting this new webinar um, uh, produced and published online. So those are the kind of the things that we have going on, the things that we have done in the past, and, and our vision for the future. Uh, so that kind of concludes what I have to say. Do you folks have any questions for me? And you're the uh, liaison for the show, for affordable housing. Yes. I'll let you have comments first. Uh, I just am very appreciative of all the work that you all are doing, and I am also very glad to be continuing on in different capacity. And it's yeah. Thank you for presenting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne.
Catherine. I had a question. Um, wasn't there a presentation about, um, even though it's county related, about all the people that are living in Syringa? Did you all do a pre have a presentation there? And have conversations about that. We um, we did not have a presentation. We participated in some of the workshops, um, and maybe the reason for it is because they're county and we're city, so you know we can watch and observe. But it's kind of um, iffy as to whether we can really jump into the midst of it. But yes, we've sat in on all of the workshops and kind of watched the things that are going on out there. And you might be um, interested in knowing our next commission meeting is Wednesday, right here in this room at 545. And there's uh, the sixth grade students from the Palouse Charter School who are doing a presentation on what they have uh, researched and witnessed out there. Uh, so uh, hopefully that answers your question. If you wanted to attend Wednesday night, that would be great. Thank you. Brandy? Yes. One question. Um, the uh, collaboration that you've been working with ASUI and with the resources that you've developed um, on the web page, will there be an opportunity for the university or maybe ASUI in, in particular to link to the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission for students to be able to access that through the university web page somehow? Yes, and okay. I'm going to kind of defer to Anne a little bit on that. What we're kind of envisioning, we'll have a link on uh, the city's website that will direct them over to wherever this stuff is at. I, and I don't know what platform it's really put on to Brandy. I, I, okay. I'm not really able to address that. It sounds like you have a group that's we, on we got that, people so that can take care of it, that's yes. Great. Yeah. That's one of the nice things about being the chair. You know, you can delegate things. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mayor? That's exactly right. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes. You're always involved no matter what. Okay, well, other questions for uh, Randy? Well, thank you very much for that awesome report. And as always, we appreciate all the work that all of our commissions and commissioners do. So thank you, Randy. Okay, next is our annual Heart of the Arts 1912 Center Report. We've got Dwight Curtis and Jenny Kostroff here with us. So, hello, Dwight. Oh, good evening. Um, How do I do this? Good times. <laughs> Well, um, as you know, um, Heart of the Arts uh, took over management of operations uh, at the uh, 1912 Center back in 2007. And each year uh, we provide, or they provide, Heart of the Arts provides an annual report to the City Council. It used to be quarterly, now it's annual. And, um, and then before I turn this over to Jenny, I'd just like to say that um, you know, the uh, relationship between the city and uh, Heart of the Arts is just incredible. They're really great to work with, and the job that they've done over there is just nothing short of miraculous, in my opinion. I don't think the city could ever have raised the funds other than through taxes to ever have uh, done as much development as, as they have. And it's still on skyrocket schedule, and I expect that to, to continue, and as you'll see here in a moment, uh, why? And uh, has a lot to do with their leadership, I think. And uh, Jenny here is the executive director of Heart of the Arts. Still am. And let's see what else can I say before she's ready. Are you ready? I she's think almost, we're ready. almost ready. She's almost ready. And <laughs> okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jenny. <gasps> Jenny Kostroff. Brian and Dwight. In order to get a presentation going, you have to have good help. And that is the truth about running the 1912 Center, too. I have very, very good help there, too. Um, let's see. My name is Jenny Kostroff, and it's a real pleasure to be here this evening to talk to all of you, to talk to all of you. Um, we've been running the 1912 Center for a large number of years now, and I have a special quiz about that. So I'm going to open it up to our audience out here. Does anyone know how long Heart of the Arts has been running the 1912 Center for the city of Moscow. Shout One more it out than you, 10, everybody. If you know it. 11. 15, less. 15, no. 
There's prizes. 11, somebody said 11. Who said 11? <laughs> Michael? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I'm not taking credit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You win an original piece of art by Kristen Carlson Becker that features a print of the 1912 Center. And now I have another question. Does anybody know what our current community art show is at the 1912 Center? What is it called? Anybody? I know some people know it. Yes? It was Lost Things, wasn't it? Very good. It's a museum. Museum. I'm going to give it to you. The Museum of Missing Stuff. And you are a winner tonight of these magnets that were made from found objects. Congratulations. <laughs> I thought it was a found object. I thought the only place that was a missing museum was in my house. Yeah. Missing yeah. items in my house. Uh, <laughs> it was the way that we chose to get rid of all of our lost and found at the building <clears throat> by creating an art show that would feature lost and found items. Um, it's been a very fun, but it will be up through the end of March, so that's why I'm bringing it up tonight so that you all can come out to the building and check it out. So let's talk about Heart of the Arts. We are the company, a nonprofit organization that was hired by the city in 2006 to maintain, run, and grow the 1912 Center. And our goal is to enrich your lives and create community by running the 1912 Center. And we do that all the time. We offer all kinds of opportunities for the community to connect and for everyone to have um, places to meet and gather. Our officers this year were newly elected in February. Sandra Kelly is now serving as our president. I like pictures so that you know who these names are because I find in our community there are a lot of faces we recognize and maybe don't know their names or vice versa. Dave Harlan is our vice president. Mary Packer is our treasurer this year. And Duncan Palmatier will be serving as our secretary. Um, and then we have a board of 13 that run, the, that are my boss. I have a boss of 13. Um, and these are some of those board members. And then, so Ben Amon, Stephanie Clarkson, David Herbold, Stephen Locker, Caleb Parker, Linda Paul, Melissa Rockwood, Bill Terrio for Friendly Neighbors, and Mary Beth Staben. And that is our board. Um, and they do a good job of running this. And now, a picture of the staff from 2017. It's so important that you know who might be there at the building when you come to work with us. Ari Carter <coughs> is on the left. Next to him, Tom Warner. Myself in the middle. Um, Robbie Valier and Erin O'Rourke. Um, she left us in the fall. And Jules Carr Chelman, who is featured in our dish pit at the kitchen, um, is a ex dishwasher extraordinaire. He actually enjoys washing the PCEI plate project dishes very, very much. He himself, I think, is also a Boy Scout. Um, and uh, Jules joined our staff this fall, which is really fun. So I decided, in order to kind of showcase what we did over the course of a year, that I would look at something from each month. So in January, the last champion came to town. It was a Hollywood movie that was filmed here in Moscow. And they filmed on the top floor and turned it into a classroom that you see there. Um, and that will be featured in the movie when you see the last champion. Look for the 1912 Center in it, our hallway as well as a classroom. In Sickness and in Health was our community art show last year, and um, that was, uh, I think we had over 40 artists participate in that. The current show, we have over 50 artists. It's super fun. <coughs> Winter markets on Saturdays in February and March of 2017 and also in November and December. I just didn't put those months down. Um, and we opened a little free pantry in the building. So this is a fun space. And I say fun because we say you need something, you take something. You have something, you give something. So this pantry that I added to the front entry on the east end of the building allows for you to bring your extras. If you bought two things and you didn't mean to buy two, you can put the other one there on the pantry. Someone that needs it will take it home. Um, it is a trading post of sorts for people to have resources and for those that are in need to not feel like they are um, in a place where they have to showcase their need, they can just pop into the entryway, take what they need, and head home. Um, it's been a really great exchange over the course of this past year, so it's been really fun to have it in there. Um, in April, we were featured in this very room, and I have a picture with the mayor. Woo! And we won an Earth Day Award for sustainability at the building, and I think that had a lot to do with running Plate Project and, um, and doing fun things like installing 
sinks with sensors, the faucets with sensors so that, you know, when you wash your hands, they turn off when you move your hands away. It's very exciting. Very exciting. See, you know, you can make faucets exciting. Tyler's not here anymore, but he knows. All right, and then in, Idaho, um, in May, Idaho Gives takes place, and it's a one-day online fundraising extravaganza, and there will be, that will be happening again this year on the first Thursday in May. Um, so on that date, we raised over $5,000 online and won a golden ticket of $1,000 and another prize of $250, so we had additional money come in, prize money for participating in the day, which was very exciting. And um, we encourage encourage everybody to, to come out and give online that day just $19. We don't want you to go big bu bucks on that one. $19 does the trick because on Idaho Gives, it's the most number of participants that matters. Um, and that's an online um, day of giving in the whole state of Idaho. In June, we ch did a, a trial run of the upstairs space to see what it sounded like with chamber music in the space. This summer, we'll be featuring an entire series of performances upstairs so that you you too, as community members, can come hear what that space will sound like. We're doing this in sort of demonstration of what the next spaces to come in the building will be, and we want people to sort of check them out, explore them, think of what you could use and do in those spaces. So the, the chamber music event was wonderful. It was for our donors to date so that they could be the first ones to experience that space. Um, and so we invited them out, and it was really wonderful the music in there is ridiculous so we were so excited and so we hope all of you can come out this summer um art walk we featured ernie weiss in june and then we had three actually four plaza concerts over the summer plaza concerts are free concerts on the front plaza if you see us playing music out there on a monday night please come and join us it's you can bring a picnic dinner you can buy food there we have beer and wine for sale and um, the music's free and at intermission we take people upstairs in the upper floors so that you can see the next phases of uh, the project which is really exciting all the renovation that we will be doing in August, we had a fundraising event where we partnered with the Kenworthy Performing Arts Center and the McConnell Mansion and the Lataw County Community, uh, sorry, Lataw County Historical Society um, to do Dine Through Time. So you started in 1920 down at the Kenworthy and had appetizers and champagne cocktails and watched three movies about these three wonderful historic establishments that are in our town. And then after that, you either rode the bus or you walked on up to the 1912 Center to have your dinner, which was a six course meal that would have been served in 1912. So you could experience what that would have been like. And it was really wonderful. And Jim Bullen's fine smoked salmon was featured um, in, as one of our courses. It was a, a wonderful dinner. And then after you went up to the McConnell Mansion to listen to the Cherry Sisters revival play and have some pie and coffee. So you would experience the 18, we were 1912 and then they were 1890s. So it was really fun to have that dining through time experience. In August, we also had the University of Idaho students come and participate in <coughs> the Serving Their New Community Day and help us organize plate project and um, put a uh, hundred new chairs that were donated to us for the plaza um, into storage. So we had to do a lot of rearranging that day. We hosted a rummage sale in September, the first time we've done something like this. Um, it was a partnership with Friendly Neighbors, and as it turns out, when you're downsizing your house, you have a lot of stuff to give away, which is very exciting because <coughs> our rummage sale had very fun things in it. Um, and then we raised enough money to purchase a new steam table for the kitchen, which was in need of uh, re, um, uh, uh, refreshing. Um, the steam table that was in the 1912 Center Kitchen had been in this building while it was the community center space when it was downstairs and it just got moved up there and I think it might have even been in the police department before that like it was an old steam table um, so we were really pleased to um, move it along to a, a new location um, in September, we hosted Susan Howlett. Um, it was a, we received a grant from the um, Moscow Giving Circle to bring her, she's a consultant from Seattle, and she um, does incredible work with nonprofits in, the, um, in her region, and she works uh, all over doing different, um, 
conferences, pre presentations, and, and um, lectures about uh, being a better board member or how to do fundraising for your nonprofit in the best way you can. So we were able to give away free participation in her two different workshops um, by uh, supporting that with the grant from the Giving Circle. And it was an incredible day of learning at the building. Um, October is actually our busiest month. So if you want to know what month has the most events in it at the 1912 Center, it is October. April is the close second, typically, and then after that, um, there's a lot of ties for um, activities. But in October, we can find every single room in the building occupied at the same time and as many as two to three events in each room during the course of a day. Um, so this is just sort of a sample. This was a birthday party that was getting set up and then a, a large panel discussion. I think you might be in that picture up there, Brandy, but this is a, yeah. like October, um, one of the candidate forums that was hosted in the building. Yeah. Um, we partnered with the uh, Leita County Historical Society again in November. They held their first harvest dinner in the 1912 Center. They've always hosted it in other locations, and this was the first time they've come to the building, and it was really fun to have that um, soup and dessert and um, a wonderful uh, gathering for everybody on a Sunday afternoon. And then in December, we have finally, finally added a sign to the corner of the property that says 1912 Center. So we can help Marshall remember we're not the 1912 building, we're the 1912 center. And that way it's on there and it has our address and it makes us a place. So now just the Google point thing shows this and also 1912 center is on there and it helps people understand this is a center and it was built, the building was built in 1912 and it's a center for everybody. And so we're really excited to have that. This is the temporary sign. Everyone's like, oh, that's a nice permanent sign. It's like, no, this is the temporary sign to show what the actual mosaic tile will look like when it is completed. And we're working with an artist out of Boise on the actual mosaics, and the installation will be multi-part fun. So watch for it in the future. But anyhow, right now we finally have a sign on the property. And to show how far we've come, I found a picture for Marshall tonight because I knew he was going to be here, um, of the parade leading to the cutting of the ribbon when that was, the building was opened in October of 2001. And everyone's climbing on across the street and going to the parade and um, to the great room. And the great room was the first space to be opened in October of 2001. And now in 2016, all of the windows on the front of the building, and in fact, every single window in the building has been replaced. And that's been a product of all of our fantastic donors and community of supporters um, making this project happen. Um, I also found this really cool picture that I thought I would share with you, the Senior Center in 2001 because when you were hosting that event in the great room people were peeking into the next phase of construction which was <coughs> the senior center space and friendship hall space so those were like the sneak peek then and now this is uh, I just took this picture the other day in um, the senior center this is the blindness and diabetic support group that meets every Wednesday and they're hanging out in the senior center and I snapped their picture and they don't know I took it so there we go um, it shows that we've come a ways <laughs> So, oh, this is interesting. This scaled differently. How fun. This is turned wrong. And I don't know why it does this stuff, because I love PowerPoint. But um, this is supposed to be this direction. And is there a pointer on here that I can? I don't know how to do this stuff. Let's see. Is it the button on the top? It is? Oh, it is. OK. So this should be the front. This is 3rd Street along here. So we're pretending that this is really stretched out the wrong direction. It's supposed to be turned. Um, I don't know why that doesn't lock. Okay, so this um, is the space that's right above the great room here. Um, so this overlooks the patio out these windows. And this is the small auditorium where we will be hosting um, some afternoon concerts on Sundays. Um, the first event will be a reading of The Odd Couple. And my husband, Michael Kostroff, will be playing Felix. No, he's playing Oscar. And Dave Harlan, our vice president from the board, will be reading the character of Felix. It will be a staged reading, and it will be a lot of fun. Um, so that's going to be on June 10th. That's our first um, event upstairs. And then um, from there, that one's a ticketed event just because we don't know how many people might want to show up for that, so we figured we should probably ticket it. Um, but then after that, all the concerts will just be um, like an acapella group or 
acoustic guitar, some things that we can hear what the space sounds like with the different instruments and music. And we will have one in July and one in August upstairs on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so that's this little stage here and that area there. And then this space has been designated to be our community living room. That is what that space is, <coughs> is we're looking to call it. It will be the green room space for when someone's performing in the small auditorium that they can hang out in the community living room before they perform um, or as a place to be during intermission. And um, so that space is already determined and we've had a number of donors um, commit windows to that space. <coughs> and then down at the bottom here that's really on the west end of the facility, the front room will be the historic classroom that will take kids back in time to 1913 school when we're completed with it. Um, but if you come this summer, we'll take you on a tour of that space so you can see the classroom and kind of get a feel for what that's going to be. Um, and those are the spaces that are determined at this point. And so that means we have some interesting spaces to think about. And our use committee and our development committee that partner with the um, council members Members and our community and Heart of the Arts board members are working on those pieces so that next year when I come here to talk to you we'll both have raised a lot more dollars towards this project because we're thinking it's going to be a 1.5 million dollar project um, and I'm about halfway there in the fundraising so I'm on my way with that um, but we're, we're still <coughs> plugging along so this year we're going to do it and um, we're going to raise the money to do this construction in 2019 or 2020 so that's the goal um, and that way you guys know what's on the, the horizon at the 1912 Center and we've, we um, took this picture of the building while I was taking a tour upstairs there a couple uh, weeks ago um, and it's kind of neat because if you look at all these are the little rafters that are up in the building if you look up when we have the lights on in the evening you can actually see all of those and if you look up during the daytime on the outside of the facility look up you can actually see our skylights in the top floor um, those were covered for most of the life of the building and now they're letting light back in um, to that space and those will be restored once we're done with the top floor renovation but in this next project the the focus is this floor right here we're calling in that the second floor and usually when you come in you're entering in through this door or the other side both of those <coughs> go in the parking lot across this around the, the exterior of the facility and it's super fun to run this building I consider it a great privilege and I thank the City Council and our community for all the wonderful years of support but also that we are in this together to do the next phase so do you have any questions for Jenny me? Jenny you have this lady has as much enthusiasm now as she did 11 years ago and I I don't know if anybody could squeeze any more conversation in a short period of time than Jenny so uh, <laughs> you well, and you're really you're very, very smart, Jenny. You can talk faster than I can think most of the time, but as you always have got that enthusiasm. That I have no that doubt. Mean I lost you halfway through the presentation. <laughs> I have no doubt <laughs> yeah, that you will raise what you need to photos. raise. Yeah. Questions for Jenny? I have a question Jim? for Jen. If you go back to the oh. schematic of the second floor. Yes, that's badly oriented. Yes, I can do that. The other one is turned wrong. So the the concert venue there how what's the seating capacity in we that? don't yeah. know so when university <laughs> well no i'm serious yeah. um we don't know we're projecting about a hundred in that space when it's renovated but we're not completely <coughs> sure so part of the study that we'll be doing is we bought the chairs that university best western was selling for a couple dollars a chair and so um they now have new chairs out there and we have all their old chairs they're still padded and lovely and i don't know why they sold them but anyhow, I felt like I scored. But those will be the chairs that we can set up in there. And we're going to see what the capacity can be in that space in terms of rows of reasonable seating and everything. Um, so we have 100 chairs to mess with, and we'll see what that does. Um, part of this is just sort of... Um, to have daytime occupancy up there where the sunlight is in the facility and and people sign a piece of paper before they go upstairs that says you know you're entering <coughs> a construction zone bathrooms are down on the first floor the here are your exit locations all of that fun stuff we had a penthouse picnic up there in the past too and that was a lot of fun to bring people up there but we're projecting about a hundred to be and and we might find that it's less than that so we just haven't laid out the chairs yet to see there's not some fire code restriction on how many people could be in the room. Well, I'm there's like 
three exit doors out of that room too. So, um, but um, with modern sprinkling systems, once it's fully renovated, the sprinkling systems in the room will be uh, what allows you to both have access, exit access. We'll have points of egress um, for fire safety <coughs> that would be both at the top of the stairs on each of these because the elevator here, while it works where you're not in a fire situation, when you're being sprinkled, you would have to have um, people exiting out of the facility down the stairs or down these stairs. Figure that this building, when it's fully renovated, these stairwells will be opened back up again to come up from the lower floor, plus you'll have exits leading straight out into the parking lot on both ends of this long hallway. Um, so it's pretty exciting because there's um, a lot of exit ways out of the space, plus the modern sprinkling systems do buy a lot more time in terms of fire. Uh, safety, which is great, but we're not putting the senior center up on the higher floors, so you know we're thinking logically. <laughs> Catherine, you have I was just wondering, can you give a little bit of update on the roof? The roof, well, the roof is not my project, so I am a participant in that project, but I have to be a good Jenny and sit back and let David Schott take the lead on that one. Um, so that is going to be something that will be coming forth to you, I think, in the next short while. Um, David Schott will be the one presenting on that, and we are working with the city on the roof project, but uh, that's as much as I'm feeling comfortable saying, I think. Okay. Go ahead. Dwight can. Dwight can. You're, you can? He can. Oh, good. Because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the roofing uh, project will be going through committee this next week and then on to council the following week. Great. So we're ready. That's good to hear. So. Yay. Well, other questions for Jenny? I had a couple questions. Okay, yeah. yeah. You mentioned an art show last year. Are those done on an annual basis then at the Yeah, so what's super cool is this is uh, what happens to me if I have too much paperwork to do at my desk that I sit and spin up ideas of what I could ask artists in our community to create in terms of artwork. So um, in 2009 was the very first art show that I did, and I always featured, this is for everybody, if you make art, any kind. You don't have to be an artist. You can just make art. See, because this encourages people in their inner artist. You know, a lot of folks won't call themselves an artist. But if you would like to make a piece of art, it's always the first Friday in February that we do the community art show, and we always receive art the Monday prior to that at the building from 9 to 9. So the next year's theme, you're the first to hear it, is called Welcome to Paradise. What does that mean to you? Does it mean harps and angel wings? Or does it mean tropical drinks and an island or does it mean paradise creek or paradise ridge you don't know and the artists are going to get creative and we're going to be serving virgin pina coladas and angel food cake and you'll get to play a game of craps for no money because that's a pair of dice mm -hmm. and so it's going to be a lot of fun and the party is always from five to seven on the friday that we open the art show and so it's Welcome to Paradise. That's our theme. So next year, Ann, I'm expecting some artwork from you. Welcome to Paradise. How about the rummage sales at an annual event in September? We did, it was the first time we did it, and the again. seniors always have you know, a wish list for the kitchen in terms of improvements. I mean, their cabinets are, I think, also from downstairs that they just got moved from here up to the 1912 Center and put on the walls. Um, so there's all sorts of things that could be improved in that partnership, and I'm sure they would be open to doing rummage sales again. It was an undertaking, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm sure And, it was. Um, you know, to make... Thousand, thousand, a couple thousand dollars um, it was like weeks of collecting from people's homes and stuff like that but luckily we have this space upstairs that's not being occupied that we could put some stuff that was going to go in the rummage sale prior to so we could just move it downstairs by the elevator it was pretty good so yeah I think it is something we might consider doing again but with with them as our partner okay fun times mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jenny has an awesome report, and uh, former Mayor Comstock, and going back to yesteryear when he was a mayor, he's got something for you, so don't run off. You do? Yep. I thought I was the one handing out presents today. Away, I'm not running. I'm this, this is actually something very special that was <gasps> given to me by former council member Jack Hill, who at the time was the superintendent of schools for the, for the Moscow School District. And what this is, it is the first penny 
donated from Jack Hill to the city of Moscow for the renovation of the 1912 center. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> and I did not steal money from the city of <laughs> Moscow. I just kept it in safekeeping. Safekeeping, so it didn't and get spent. So it didn't get spent. <laughs> but in actuality, this belongs to the city of Moscow. And I would like to hand it okay. to Mayor Lambert. And I suspect Mayor Lambert has something he'd like to do with it. Yeah, I'm going to hand it to Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, Marcia, get on the other side. Let's get a picture of this so we can find all three of us in here. Fun fun. I have to keep holding that smile. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys, it's Abe Lincoln. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to get my my thing out. Am I allowed to just we got you. you got me. Thank, Thank you so very much, Jenny. Wonderful report. Very, very nice. Okay, we're gonna move on to item number seven, which is a Moscow's Farmers Market Handbook. Daniel Stewart is here to present. So for that. So he's Sweet. been patiently waiting all evening. Okay, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council. I appreciate the opportunity um, to go over <clears throat> our Moscow Farmers Market, the 2018 season, and our new vendor's handbook. <clears throat> um, let's see here, jumping right in. I'd like to take a moment and review some progress in our strategic plan. Um, right off the bat, Advisory and operational expectations are unclear and, and lack boundaries. These are some of the major challenge areas we identified through our strategic planning <coughs> process. And with that, we've developed a full-time position um, <coughs> along with, uh, to, uh, that, that includes some professional development opportunities that ensure the market can continue with the aid of industry uh, standards and best practices for events of this caliber. Uh, market integrity is threatened by lack of clear policies. I'm here tonight to review our new vendor handbook that has um, gone through a subcommittee process at the commission level for review. Um, our inequitable and inefficient allocation of dis and distribution of market costs. Um, we approached this with a new tiered fee structure which council uh, has reviewed and approved this past <coughs> fall. Um, and this will, this is, this has uh, been rolled into our new handbook, and we'll be implementing for the first time this season. The last two items <coughs> um, listed there: the market faces immediate and severe infrastructure needs, and the layouts unsafe, restrictive, and limits growth growth decision, decisions. Sorry. Um, these two items comes, come to us as a larger part of a whole, um, and there are current areas of focus. That we have had um, some evaluation. These challenges have gone before a small group of students from Washington State University's College of Landscape and Architecture. Um, they came up with some ideas for us as a small semester project. Um, Moving forward, in order to really understand, um, in order to know where we're going, we got to understand where we come from. So, I just wanted to highlight some of our history over the last 10 years. Um, we've been able to introduce formal policies. We've moved to Main Street, doubling our vendor capacity. We've established the Market Commission and developed a strategic planning process. Um, this is a big thank you to Kathleen Burns, who isn't here tonight, for her dedication and leadership through these and other significant accomplishments at the market. The exciting part, our new handbook. Um, I'd like to briefly go over uh, some minor and significant changes that we're, we're seeing with this handbook. 
Um, this po process of policy revision led us to the development of this new fully comprehensive handbook. Um, for me, the experience was uniquely rewarding because I got to work with our, our Farmers Market Commission um, and develop a, a workable method for reviewing and, and revising in the future. Um, fortunately, many of the pieces existed and we were left with the task of compiling and organizing. Uh, initial changes found in the new handbook are grammatic and mechanical edits to aid in the flow of the document. Uh, we <clears throat> vendor definitions have been rewritten to be more in line with industry standards. In that process, our um, vendor categories were developed. Um, the definitions were separated from specific requirements and best practices. We've moved a portion of our the, the portion of our best practices to the leading part of our vending categories um, while relocating specific requirements to a new appendix in the back of the handbook. Um, <clears throat> our vendor fee schedule has been added, the payment process updated, and our youth vending age limit has increased from 11 years to 16 years old. Some specific policy additions um, that we're seeing in writing for the first time in our handbook. Um, kind of a funny one, the prohibition of genera generators in our market. Um, it's been an unspoken thing that we've um, now given legs to in the, in the handbook. Um, we have additional contact information added, specifically um, reference to impe <clears throat> impending FISMA changes. That's the Food Safety Modernization Act. Some of our producer vendors are going to see certain specific changes coming down the line this year and next. Um, and finally, we've added a sixth appendix to the end. This includes our jury process, our site visit process, as well as those specific requirements to each of the vending categories. <clears throat> okay. Um, some of the fun stuff, upcoming programming. We're excited to um, continue popular programs like Chefs at the Market and Commissions Tabling. Our entertainment calendar, calendar is looking very full for live performances in Friendship Square. Um, that's a big thank you to Zach Ellis uh, and, and all his work he does in organizing 52 shows within the market throughout our season. Um, additionally, we are excited to partner again with the University of Idaho's College of Lag <laughs> Agriculture and Life Sciences. Um, last year, their Summer of Science program saw hundreds of science kits handed, to, handed out to youth in our community. Um, <clears throat> we look forward to continuing our partnership with Backyard Harvest and Eat Smart Idaho as they develop their levels of community engagement in the market. And finally, um, we're looking to bring Pop Club to market. Pop Club, uh, it, it comes from Farmers Market Coalition, stands for Power of Produce. Um, this is a fun collection of uh, programs that are uh, geared towards nutrition education for youth. So we're, we're excited to kind of roll that out. It's, um, it, it, it's put in, into practice by dozens of markets nationwide. Uh, moving on, volunteerism at the market. Um, now this has been mentioned several times tonight. Volunteering is a major part of the success at market and, and it happens in, 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 in many facets. Um, we intend on driving that further. Um, while the vision and, and the core fundamentals of market are guided by the Farmers Market Coalition, or <clears throat> excuse me, the Farmers Market Commission, which is a key gr group of volunteers, operations are aided um, by the service of other community members as well. <clears throat> and you can see here, most of our operational volunteer roles have been supported through our student population. Um, both of these are sync days that had taken place last year. Um, we're currently developing additional opportunities to extend our reach throughout the community at a much wider spectrum. 
looking to include um, all sorts of people from the community to get them involved in market in several different levels. <clears throat> um, accessibility, community accessibility, being a core value for the market, providing access to locally grown produce, foods, unique handmade goods and their producers is paramount to operations. In addition to <clears throat> providing access to SNAP and EBT benefits, excuse me, the market has great success providing access to actually Washington residents receiving WIC and SFMNP <coughs> benefits. So that's women, infants, and children, and senior farmers market nutrition program. Um, kind of a point of pride on the SFMNP. I was speaking recently with the, the regional manager of the program. We are the only market outside of Washington State to facilitate these benefits. On top of that, um, we give their numbers a good run for the money. So we're doing really good here. <clears throat> I've spoken with the state of Idaho uh, a couple of times and they're very interested in, in what's going on so we'll see if we can't bring this to our state. Um, <clears throat> let's see, okay, moving on. Well, in addition to um, financial access, we've worked hard to improve the physical access to citizens with ADA challenges. Um, in the upper right corner here, you'll notice it's sort of a small picture, sorry for that. That is our northernmost bay of the Jackson Street parking lot. Um, last year, we were able to work with our ADA coordinator to <clears throat> establish a full parking lot, um, increasing our stalls from eight stalls to 20. Uh, throughout all of market um, and this is adjacent to our new ADA accessible restroom downtown. Um, I've had a lot of really great comments about the combination of two at market. Um, additionally, we will be continuing our positive messaging and educa education regarding non-ADA service animals at market. Um, the little side note here, this puppy here <laughs> is named Midas. Um, the two of these dogs had um, come through market in some training fashions and, and we've decided to uh, implement their cute faces here. But Midas is continuing on training in, in Oregon. I just got this today. So um, he's at the Guide Dogs for the Blind Academy and it's progressed through phase three of eight. We're very happy and in support of Midas. <clears throat> and then wrapping up, we have a few important dates to pay attention to. Um, this Thursday, March 8th, is our vendor orientation meeting. And <clears throat> our, um, oh, at the Latok County Fairgrounds from three to five. Our farmer's market poster contest comes to a close March 28th at 5 p.m. Um, we'll take all of the submissions, put them through the review process, and then select our winner, uh, announcing that in early April. Um, let's see, vendor jury dates. We have three juries this year, April 4th, June 6th, and August 8th. Our reservation forms and information are available online now. And then, um, oh, well, commissions. A nice plug for commissions, so we'll be meeting here tomorrow. We meet the first Tuesdays of each month, generally at 4 p.m., generally here at City Hall. Um, and then the most important day, of course, opening day. So that would be May 5th, um, 8 a.m. Same great place, same great time, downtown Friendship Square. That's it. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question, Daniel. We, yes. the last year was the first year, first full year that we had the restroom in place. What kind of comments uh, did you hear about the restroom that we added in downtown? Um, I have the pleasure of announcing all positivity. <laughs> uh, folks were very excited to, um, which is funny to be so excited over a bathroom, but um, it's also not. Um, we were um, receiving a lot of uh, compliments on the styling 
but also the accessibility um, and especially how early it opens too you know I have market may start at 8 a.m. but I have vendors that will make a two or three hour drive to get there at six or seven and and so having accessible restrooms before seven o'clock downtown has been um, in a very important part of, of, of market and uh, really has benefited you know not not just the the patrons but the, the vendors alike I had a, a couple of weeks ago I had a conversation with somebody about uh, the restroom and because we were able to put it in in 2017 I made a comment about David Pierce had done some research and the first time it was talked about downtown was in 1917 that just sticks in my mind it took a hundred year process to, to get it but we got it so there you have it the century sure. bathroom yeah. yes <laughs> questions for Daniel uh, I do have a question I have a statement and then a question for you, okay. Thank um, you. having having been on the the ground floor of the farmers market commission as part of the chamber this represents a gargantuan effort and and I commend you and the Commission and our strategic planner extraordinaire Jen Piffner as well very 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 good work and I I was lucky I got a copy of the Ooh, of the, the manual copies. itself sorry and it is word. it is beautiful <coughs> I do have a question yes. for you about the youth um, vendors we we moved it from 11 to 16 and mm -hmm. I just what was the process there I, I I have no doubt we did a good process but I just wasn't aware of it so would you oh yes yeah please certainly um, this was a topic that was <coughs> um, reviewed quickly I believe um, last year I, I saw an expanse of interested young entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, sort of confused by the the process and I wanted to be able to have a chance to really walk them through as they're learning things in life as well um, we took a look at the age level and what made sense um, generally what we found is when you start breaking that point of youth entrepreneurship is almost at the same point as you start gaining employment and so uh, we, we found a a, a division line there at the age of 16 um, once they can start driving to market then maybe they should we'll sign them up as um, regular adult type vendors okay so what I misunderstood there was that we didn't take any vendors under 16 but we do at, they turn into an adult at 16 in our eyes correct <coughs> yeah and at Perfect. that case it, it uh, at the years before it had been 12 they'd sort of moved into that regular vending category or, okay yeah I appreciate that clarification yes Catherine. excuse me my question had to do with um, the pass-through areas that you had started to design and try in trying to make it so that people could access the um, stores and the different other businesses have you made more clear delineations in that you know so when you're walking in the market or when you're ha to able to get over to the to the stores certainly yes thank you uh -huh. um, well number one we've we've kept those areas so they are locked in in our map um, strategically placed intermediately from all of the major entry points of market and then yes we'll continue our um, our messaging for those I think I had some simple cone and stick signs placed in the center of those but yeah I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to um, the <coughs> making these more aware um, not only for our patrons but it, you know this is this is a, a way to help connect to our downtown business core as well and mm -hmm. that was sort of why we had placed them in there last year and, mm -hmm. and, and so we'll definitely continue that and continue the uh, messaging for them great thank you awesome other questions for Daniel I'd, I'd just like to commend Daniel and the Commission for all the work on this handbook because it's a, it's a very complicated Mm -hmm. situation and they're trying to be all things to all people all the time and they generally succeed at that which is <laughs> remarkable and uh, it was quite a process to get through all this and it it is a big improvement and it's much more readable and it's much more understandable for the vendors so thank you very much thank you for that Jim. Mm -hmm. well and that's an action that we actually have to take tonight yeah I move to that's approve the <laughs> Moscow Farmers Market 2018 vendor handbook second <coughs> 
I've got a motion by Catherine and a second by Ann to approve the Moscow Farmers Market 2018 Vendor Handbook. Questions I, for anybody? No, sorry. Okay, well, we'll start with Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Brandy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> okay. Aye. 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 Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that wonderful job of pres presentation. Our farmers market being the number one in the state for six years running. It's always a nice brag point for us whenever we go to Boise so that we can point that out to them. And I love doing that. So Okay, well that that is the conclusion of our meeting, so we will go on to reports. And I'll start with you, Catherine. Oh, okay. Uh, I will be attending farmer's market meeting tomorrow. Um, but in the meantime, I got to see Ann speak at the She Should Run um, panel discussion on Thursday night. What night was the that? First. It was the first. And um, it was very interesting. Um, there was Ann and the, the representing the city of Moscow. There's um, the representative from Coeur d'Alene, uh, Carolyn Nielsen from Troy, Paulette Jordan, so just the four and the and Sophia visiting from Arcata oh, in oh, California. okay yeah so then and she was from the national organization so it was a really good message um, about asking um, women to run specifically to try to kind of get the balance so they ha we have better representation and <clears throat> so if you know anybody that you think should run ask them to run and you can go on to she should run.org and then also write it, try to get there, because then there was poverty on the police, mm -hmm. which I barely made it for, and so I'll let you definitely talk about that. And then the, the last thing, and hopefully Gina can talk more on, is the bike share. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's it for me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the only commission that has met in the last two weeks was planning and zoning last Wednesday, and the majority of the discussion was around uh, basically the elimination of one of our zoning codes which is ag forest so there's about eight properties and we walked through all of them that still remain in that um, designation and so we're looking at the possibility of moving them to farm ranch which is a, a better fit and so um, yeah that was the most of the discussion and then there was a shared reading creating great neighborhoods density in your community and that was very interesting I, I personally really appreciate that they do shared readings and add that to their um, to the work that they do and, and really that conversation was about sort of the advantages to density when done right and and what that looks like not just density for density's sake and that is all I had okay Gina okay so uh, both of my commissions meet uh, to th tomorrow and Thursday so I'll have more to tell you at the next council meeting for my commission assignments I did attend the Lime bike uh, meeting put on by the University of Idaho basically this is a bike share uh, company they're out of I don't, do know remember? Mm -mm. I don't remember where they were out of but essentially it is a no cost to uh, the university or the city they will come in and um, bring in regular bikes they have uh, powered scooters that look like serious fun and electric bikes as well um, the powered scooters were less there were less of those but they were they were looking at potentially 500 bikes for our community to bring in and to see how uh, we actually move ourselves around the city that way um, I was concerned immediately about our public transit I thought okay good this is competition it actually is not surprisingly in their research they found that that bringing in a bike share into a community with an already existing public transit oftentimes will support and increase ridership on the on the public transit they're they're beautiful green bikes they are um, they have a relatively inexpensive hourly rate depending on what you get if you get a bike that you pedal yourself or one that actually goes on its own you know the electric bike um, you know it, it looks like a about a dollar every 10 minutes for the electric bike and from there it goes down um, for the ones that you actually self-power but kind of a cool idea um, there are many many bike companies like this so line bike was the first one I don't know who they were talking about there were some other fun um, potentials that they might bring in so we'll take a look at that when it comes in I also was lucky enough and I do mean this sincerely to um, attend and be part of the city's master planning advisory group for the sanitation system the comprehensive sanitation system uh, plan so uh, we just had the kickoff meeting on um, February 28th 
And it really, believe it or not, was very interesting, <coughs> not just related to sewer and stuff like that. It was really kind of exciting. So as I get into it more, I will bring you more information, but I'm happy to be there. Okay, Jim. Um, but the only thing I have is uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to participate in the with the volunteer fire department in the uh, uh, Columbia Center stair climb firefighter stair climb to raise uh, funds for the cure of cancer and last year we raised three million dollars in one day which is phenomenal um, there will be 2,000 firefighters from all over the world that come climb the Columbia Center all in the same day and um, it was an awesome experience and I'm really happy to be invited back and um, uh, I know some of you have uh, decided that you'll help sponsor me for that and um, so I'll ask you after the meeting how much that is and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that and it's great to spend time with the with the resident firefighters. Brandy. Uh, all right uh, Historic Preservation Commission meeting um, they are busy working on the uh, sign development for the 1912 building. It's not the, I'm sorry, 1912 center, excuse me. <laughs> he infected you. <laughs> uh, um, not the 1912 center sign, but a historical sign that actually does go over the, the background of uh, when it was the school and how it how it has been repurposed over the years with visuals kind of similar their ideas that some of the informational signs that are on campus uh, has, of historical so it's very cool they're working on that um, and also uh, there was some discussion about how much uh, involvement they should have with the University of Idaho as far as pursuing um, the nomination of a historic campus core to be in the National Registry there and, and they, they had decided that they would offer a support supporting role if that's something that the university wanted to pursue they would be happy to be a resource to let them know how um, how they established the uh, historic district here in the city so um, yeah and uh, ORCID awards will be coming up and they plan to uh, have a celebration of both the Orchid Awards and the um, Fort Russell Historic District expansion um, to make people aware of both of those things that are going on. They've, they've had a lot happening. Then um, the Urban Renewal Agency met and um, President Gage uh, signed off on the audit. Everything looks good there. And uh, Bill Belna presented the 2017 annual report, which looks really good. It has a wonderful summary of everything that's happened over the past year. The main thing that happened at that last meeting is the commission approved the um, Main Street expansion eligibility study to proceed forward. And um, that will at some point be coming to the council as well. Uh, on the first, I'll let the mayor talk about it a little bit more, but I attended the second of his Poverty on the Palouse um, meetings, which was very lively and well attended. and. Then on the second, I uh, went to the um, healthcare, is it a human right discussion that was uh, kind of sponsored by the Human Rights Commission and that was held here in the chamber with a local physician, Dr. Boughton, uh, Dr. Rushi, retired physician from Lewiston and Don Burnett, the attorney, um, as the panel talking about that concept of is healthcare a right? And that was very interesting too, so. Okay. Well, on February 28th, we had an airport board meeting, <clears throat> and it talked to you, know, kind of the exciting stuff is we're going to actually start doing some paving this year in 2018. It'll be completed in October of 2019. I'm very looking very much forward to that. One of the things that will happen, it'll be a year from now uh, in 2019, and it'll be in the summer time, the slowest time that airport will actually be closed for three weeks to be able to do the crossed paving so that it doesn't interfere with runways uh, and so that will take place in the summer of 2018 and we're also looking at a new terminal and the possibilities of financing that and how we're going to do the financing and all that sort of thing and there will be more to come in the future on that so we'll see how that goes so on March the 1st we had poverty on the plus food and insecurity in this very room here and actually I was really kind of tickled because there was a lot of stuff that actually got done there was some real meat to it uh, this time and so it's kind of an interesting thing because of the foods insecurity and 
we've got a lot of things going for us in our area for the food bank the Moscow food bank and there's a lot of coordination between getting the things that we have and making it even that much better and, <coughs> and getting everybody educated in the process of it. it was a pretty interesting meeting it was really really amazing on uh, March the 2nd I had an AIC board conference call on legislative various legislative issues that was my highlight on March the 2nd my highlight on March the 2nd was being able to go to Lena Whitmore and read Dr. Seuss to first graders as well as other books to the fourth graders and then going to McDonald's and reading to a group of kids solid for about an hour and a half and they were all the way from kindergarten to the fifth graders back and forth and so uh, green eggs and ham I got that one memorized I read that three <laughs> different times that day so it was a fun day but it was very very good Gary do you have anything for us before we adjourn yes sir we do have our monthly breakfast meeting on Wednesday this at the uh, quiet room in the hub uh, at the University of Idaho campus uh, the mayor and I and Councilmember Truscio will be in Washington, D.C. beginning this Friday, returning Thursday the 15th. So uh, that's going on. The mayor mentioned <clears throat> about the legislation that's wending its way through the Idaho legislature. One of the issues that has come forward is the funding of magistrate courts. Uh, there is some um, uh, Idaho code that allows uh, judges to make the decision in certain cases <clears throat> ordering cities to fund not only the chambers of a court but also the equipment and the personnel to run it so that's something that is being litigated elsewhere in Idaho um, a joint uh, committee consisting of representatives of cities counties and um, the court system <clears throat> have been working for the past oh several months on some alternatives and there is an alternative that's being uh, discussed now it was passed by the Judiciary and Rules Committee <clears throat> of the House that will hopefully uh, solve the funding problem by taking some of the liquor uh, state liquor funding <clears throat> excuse me and allocating it to uh, maintenance of a magistrate court system it would involve a reduction in the percentage of liquor funding that goes to the cities and the counties and there would also be some support from um, court fees but it's something that is being considered at this point the mayor has drafted a letter which will go down in support of that uh, legislation tomorrow so uh, just keeping up to date on what's going on in the legislature okay very good and then we adjourn Gather made an adjournment. Okay, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? We will adjourn at 8.51. Thank you very much. Boy Scout Troop 345, uh, Scoutmaster Ted Wheeler, thank you kids for being here with us this evening. Oh,